Bonjour, good morning, salam. My name is Brinda Narayan, Associate Professor at McGill University's Faculty of Law and a member of the Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. Together with the Transnational Solidarity Network, Women Living Under Muslim Laws, or Bloom, and Concordia University Simone de Beaufort Institute, we're very pleased to welcome you to our webinar, Demanding Justice, Freedom and Participation for Women of Afghanistan, which forms an integral part of Bloom's campaign to support women's demands for their rights, freedom, and meaningful participation in Afghanistan today. Bloom is concerned with safeguarding women's human rights and progress, safeguarding women's constitutional rights, countering the Taliban's extreme religious claims as a legitimate authority, and reinforcing the understanding of the framework of cultural legitimacy to ensure sustainable change within the framework of Islamic laws and tradition with respect to democracy and governance. We are honored to have with us today four eminent guests, Professor Homa Hutfa, Professor of Anthropology Emerita at Concordia University, Montreal, her field-based research and expertise are in political economy and legal anthropology. Professor Hudfa is one of the founders of Women Living Under Muslim Laws Network, whose mission is to promote gender equality and pluralist democracy. Balwasha Hassan, senior fellow at Georgetown University, is a women's rights and peace activist focusing on women's and girls' education. Ms. Hassan is a co-founder of the Afghan Women's Network, a leading women's rights organization in Afghanistan. Notably, she was a member of the Constitutional Lawyer Jirga. Zarka Yaftali is a peace builder and advocate for women's rights, protection, and participation in Afghanistan. She works in the areas of violence and discrimination against women and girls, access to education, human rights mechanisms, justice, and property rights. Our fourth speaker is Mona Tajali, Professor of International Relations and Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies. She's the Director of the Human Rights Center and also Director of the Middle Eastern Studies Program at Agnes Scott College in Atlanta, Georgia. Her areas of expertise are gender and politics, human rights and social movements in Muslim countries. Uh, in terms of the format of today's event, I'll just send, say a few words. After our speakers' presentations, we'll open the floor to a moderated Q&A for about 20 minutes. Please send your questions to me in the chat. Um, and finally, a note of caution in case we have any Zoom bombers, Sharon is going to, is to take care of the situation. So apologies in advance if anything like that does happen. Uh, before I pass the floor to the speakers, I would like to uh, pass the virtual mic to the director of the Simone de Beauvoir Institute to say a few words. Carolina, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Narain. I just want to say that the Simone de Beauvoir Institute at Concordia University is really, really pleased to co-sponsor this event to, uh, help provide a space for these speakers and to collaborate with McGill University. Simone de Beauvoir famously said, one's life has value so long as one attributes value to the life of others. And I think that this event is really in the spirit of that. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much. And thank you for being a host, uh, host institution. Um, I pass it now to Homa. Homa Jan Flosios. Thank you very much. Um, actually, um, Verinda has already explained a little bit about the background of uh, uh, Women Living Under Muslim Law, which is a feminist network of women who live, uh, whose lives are touched in one way or the other by laws or values set to driven from Islam. Um, I also want to say that it was set up uh, in, in response to, um, in response to the political development and Islamization of um, a legal system and code there. I mentioned this ag uh, again because as it happens our, in our panel, we are just discussing again, um, drive to Islamization after all these, after about like 40, almost 40 years of resistance again in Afghanistan. But our goal was when we set up this organization, just to remind us was that, was to support women who, um, to support women who were uh, imprisoned or or harassed or some uh, occasionally executed because of their, they objected to the way that the legalization, Islamization of the legal system has denied them their human rights and citizenry rights. 
um, at the time, no organization considered, considered working for gender equality as political, therefore not worthy of support. So in a way, we, were, we set up this organization because we thought we have to support each other in the struggle for gender equality. And also the, like to bring uh, the information to the uh, international community at time. Remember that time there were, in 1980s, we didn't have we didn't have internet and we didn't have social media. So it was a very important decision, but also to connect women in the Muslim countries so that they can come together and, and share experiences and, and if when possible, develop this ethos of collective forms of resistance across the borders. We, and the, another important, important factor at the time was to join the committee that uh, was set up to to, uh, it, this was a transnational committee of women's organization to work for women's human recognition of women's human rights and elimination of all form of violence against women. Because the CEDA was didn't even mention the word violence at the time. So it was very important. And, and for us was to create collective project to also create knowledge and bring people, bring um, kind of information that would empower women to demand their rights. And one of the first program, of course, we had family law, that is a comparative law that it was uh, launched in 28 countries and it uh, ignited a whole lot of other research and other women's organization in the Muslim countries and brought reforms that touched the lives of millions of people, some small, some larger reform. Unfortunately, not, not enough yet, but it did, it was very important and it is still continues. Now I want to um, move to our partnership with, um, with our Afghan sister. Um, in fact, Wulum um, has worked from the very, uh, from the 1980s with, uh, Afghan, with Afghan women. At the time, because of the upheaval and civil war, there was a huge, um, huge uh, um, refugee, um, refugee movement, of people fleeing the civil war coming to Afghanistan and Iran, especially in their millions. And so, um, especially in Pakistan, Ulum, um, um, together with Sheikh Edgar, was working with, uh, with women, of, often actually encountering World Bank and UNHCR approach to question of women. Um, in 1994, we started the project of looking at social change and what it means in the long term for, for women, their, their ex um, the, them being exposed to completely different way of the, or definition of being Muslim and and living Islam. So that was that was a project. That's when I met I met um, and worked with uh, with uh, um, Palva Shaw, our distinguished speakers, and today and we have continued to work. Then then we started to work of of course with publicizing Taliban when Taliban round one. The 96 to 2001, and and then uh, uh, and publicizing, uh, um, approaching, talking to human rights organizations. Um, by the time 2001, when uh, Taliban fell, we worked with women in uh, supporting women in the making of the constitution 2004, and then um, uh, we also did uh, research observing what the role of women was, which was. Um, which was very important to see how, in fact, women managed to bring women together, but also to participate and bring uh, more of a uh, local uh, views into into the constitution making. After that, we work on with Pan Russia, We work on um, uh, family law and nikah, and then, of course, it can our connection uh, working with and being. Um, part of the, uh, the movement has continued until the 2020 when the peace talk was going on, we really thought, okay, this is the time to engage again. And we did launch a campaign um, in, in support of the peace talk. At the time we were hoping that the peace talk will result in, in a transition, um, transition um, and, uh, but, uh, that would be inclusive and lead to more democracy and protect women's rights, but it didn't happen. I will stop. I sorry I didn't check the time. Hopefully I didn't take too much time, and uh, I will then at the end of the program I come back to discuss where we are going um, 
with our work next. Thank you. Thank you, Homa. And uh, I'll pass the mic on to Palwa Shajan, please. Uh, thank you, Verna. Um, it's such a pleasure to be sharing the same platform with all of you, um, Homa Hotfar. And uh, uh, as she mentioned, uh, I knew her for a long time and uh, highly esteem her for her support and being together with Afghan women for a long time uh, for all the valuable work that we did together on laws in Afghanistan. Uh, in particular, um, but also like to thank the organizers for today event. Um, I think it's very critical discussion regarding education and how this is uh, affecting uh, women participation, whether it is the political or uh, social participation, um, uh, which is a great challenge in Afghanistan. And we know that Afghan women are almost in the verge of being forgotten uh, the way uh, things are evolving in the world. Uh, so I think this is a very uh, valuable time for all of us to make Afghan women matter uh, for what is going on inside the country. Um, so I would like to say um, uh, that uh, what I will be discussing today is more from my experience with AWAC, um, uh, Afghan Women Educational Center, which is working for the last 31 years and is focused on uh, girls and women education in Afghanistan. Um, it was started by Afghan refugee women in Pakistan, uh, but done uh, credible work uh, uh, in of uplift of education uh, inside the country. Uh, uh, from my experience that uh, I've seen, I see education um, uh, important for women empowerment, um, not only for women, but also for men uh, to be um, supportive or partners uh, in this process. Um, and by empowerment, I like to mention that uh, I refer to developing um, women as more aware individuals who are politically active, economically independent, and are able to make informed choices, intelligent decisions in matters that affect them and their nation, uh, which is very much needed at this point. Um, and my emphasis on men education comes from the fact if men are not equally educated or don't have the same experience of formal and modern education, they can remain as main obstacle as Taliban have been in their two terms uh, of governance in Afghanistan. Uh, in last term, um, they closed uh, schools for girls for six years, uh, and that included um, all level of education. And in their second term, since last six months, except primary education, secondary education has been closed um, and um, tertiary and higher education has been closed for, uh, uh, for girls only uh, up to recent last week that they allow girls to go back to universities. Um, uh, so Taliban recently opened universities uh, with the preconditioning of hijab and separate classes uh, is extremely challenging. Um, uh, while Afghanistan, um, a country going through uh, um, uh, a lot of economic challenges um, uh, where the country economy uh, depended over 20% on foreign aid. And now we know that there is um, sanction against Taliban and um, if there are any step has taken place, it has been uh, uh, really ill informed, uh, including the recent um, executive order by President Biden, uh, which could uh, put the economy of the country further sinking and uh, the impact of it will be both on men and women inside the country because it will bring a, a huge instability in Afghan currency and economy in large. Under Taliban rule, policy have been imposed, stripping women of their basic rights. And uh, under the Taliban rule, Afghanistan has become the only country in the world that publicly limits education based on gender, thus violating international human rights laws. It's important to walk back where we were um, uh, in 2001, um, 
In 2001, as I said before, uh, no girls attended formal schools and there were only 1 million boys enrolled in last, uh, uh, um, only 1 million boys were enrolled in schools or formal education. Um, but in last 20 years with the engagement of international community, uh, we had over 9 million children going back to school, which included 38% um, uh, girls. Uh, and that is almost equal number of girls and boys going to school. Although uh, despite of this improvement, uh, there have been still challenges like uh, 3.5 million children were still out of school, which included 60% girls. So the challenges uh, in Afghanistan has been beyond um, uh, restricted uh, policy of the government. Of course, we have um, a negative tradition still enforced in places. Uh, we have security, which was high in previous government. Um, uh, that was one of the big reasons. Uh, schools have been uh, continuously targeted. Teachers have been threatened or killed at times. Um, this whole uh, uh, situation created um, a situation where uh, not many girls were allowed, uh, and we especially had huge dropout when it came to the secondary uh, schooling in Afghanistan. So I uh, like to recognize that challenges um, are beyond um, uh, structural uh, policy environment in Afghanistan, which is imposed by Taliban. But I think once the government um, uh, is um, supportive of education, all other challenges um, uh, could be put on track to be uh, addressed. And so was in Afghanistan, NGOs and government were working together to address uh, a lot of this, this deprivation in the, uh, especially in the remote areas. Eric alone has been um, uh, engaged uh, in education program, for instance, 20,000 children, uh, including 60% um, girls in Paktia and Kabul province. Uh, 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 through a three years program, they were able to uh, uh, support or provide accelerated education for these children who were able to cover um, six grades in three years. Uh, and that has been enormous uh, progress. Some of these girls were later involved after continuing their education uh, in this time and joined AWIC for a lot of other projects, um, which included one of our employee in Paktia province. And she has been responsible for UN Women funded project, which was uh, regarding women and peace participation. So that shows once things are on the right track, all other challenges could be addressed. Uh, but if uh, there is a structural uh, imposition from the government, then uh, almost everything else is stopped. Um, in, uh, in Kabul, unfortunately, in Afghanistan, unfortunately, um, uh, big universities like uh, US um, American University of Afghanistan or Kabul has been targeted and um, uh, students uh, have been killed. And then Kabul University uh, has been targeted uh, by suicide bombers. In meanwhile, the, um, in the uh, crowded Hazara community or Shia community in Afghanistan has been continuously targeted with their educational institution inside that country. Um, uh, those who knows Afghanistan, despite of all challenges, we didn't had um, uh, and still um, uh, uh, we don't have that issue, which is, for instance, in neighboring Pakistan, we had with between uh, Sunni and Shiites rights. Um, so this has been all political targeting of the minorities in the country, which can, um, uh, which is creating more problems. Um, and unfortunately um, uh, it goes with impunity. Um, so um, uh, in the, uh, the association of um, uh, uh, these changes which happen in Afghanistan uh, uh, is very much strongly linked with other changes in the country. Um, uh, we had uh, a parliament which had over 28% uh, women. Um, we had women in economy involved. We had women in all level of government. And um, uh, this all combined uh, uh, had the prepared situation for women, larger participation in, uh, in Afghan society. Uh, unfortunately, um, um, 
two years back when the peace process was started or facilitated by US, uh, it had um, resulted with a very uh, narrowed outcome, which was focused on safe withdrawal of American troops from Afghanistan. And the whole thing was managed in the way um, uh, that uh, Taliban were granted with a swift victory because there was no condition for the troop withdrawals and that became the failure of intra-Afghan talk. Um, so on 15 August, Taliban took over once again the country and their first thing was to stop women from working and girls from continuing their education. Later on, uh, the primary school started, but we still have our problems with secondary schools and uh, up to recent uh, only higher education. Um, so a lot could have been different if women were hurt or taken serious because women have been very vocal on the uh, peace process to be a just um, and uh, inclusive process. And when we are talking about inclusivity, of course, there are diff different angle of inclusion. And uh, for women, it was uh, women or gender inclusion was one of the important aspects. Uh, for some reason, uh, international community turned blind eyes on women participation. There have been a token uh, uh, participation of women like four out of 21 person uh, in, uh, in, uh, from Afghan side and over 20 person, uh, 20 person from Taliban side, there were only four women in the peace negotiation. And after all the peace negotiation uh, was met with a failure the way the whole process was uh, managed um, in this uh, uh, process of hasty withdrawal of international troops from Afghanistan. Um, I think a lot can be said of the gains and also failures of the past, but here we are in a different situation and uh, 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 the country is now uh, in the hand of uh, Taliban with uh, still um, those men who were um, uh, under international sanctions uh, for uh, being labeled as um, uh, terrorists are running the country and Afghanistan is not recognized. There is no international missions in Afghanistan. So the monitoring of human rights and other uh, issues on the ground is very limited and small. Uh, women uh, advocate or met with cruelty or uh, detained uh, arbitrarily. Uh, we have all these outcries there. Uh, but how to move forward, I think it's very much important because Taliban and their government need international support and um, uh, political pressure from international community can mean a lot. And one of the important is um, uh, pressure on Taliban, especially on girls' education and women participation in social and political life of the country. So uh, uh, my overarching uh, uh, recommendation will be that Afghan women and girls should not be forgotten. And for any international community who is involved in the process, they should make sure that women are um, um, uh, mainstreamed, women participation is main mainstream in any political um, dialogue or engagement with Taliban. But in meanwhile, um, uh, important uh, issue is uh, education for all in the country. And um, uh, I think speaking with uh, represent, um, uh, in today's event, is, which is with uh, Concord, Concordia universities and uh, also Bloom participation is very much important here for two aspects. One, um, a lot of time when you are advocating on women's rights in Afghanistan, you are blamed as agent of foreign uh, countries. But I think it's important to involve the region, um, especially um, uh, involving um, uh, countries like, um, uh, uh, which has a strong uh, Islamic uh, jurisprudence in support of women. Uh, so the work we have done Homajan, in the past, I think it's still relevant. We still have to use that um, because we have to bring this argument of progressive Islamic um, um, uh, interpretation of Islamic laws uh, in support of um, uh, uh, women, not only in Afghanistan, but many other challenging uh, uh, situation in um, our region. 
because we know extremism is for some reason, uh, when there is a conflict, uh, somehow uh, religion become a tool for uh, extremist groups to use that uh, to promote uh, uh, warring groups uh, to uh, motivate or recruit uh, soldiers. And it's important in this moment uh, that women know about what is uh, what are some of those protections that they can get under Islamic laws um, and uh, to be introduced with uh, uh, different tools and that they can use um, for their own protection and pro uh, progress in the society. Also uh, by creating that uh, support supportive network uh, in the region, it's important, not only for Afghan women, I think for all other countries in the region to make sure um, uh, that they uh, could be further uh, supported in this. Um, uh, also coming back to the uh, university's environment and this, uh, today's discussion, I think we are focusing on education. It's important uh, that um, uh, Afghan girls be uh, given chance to have a quality education because the way girls are allowed only women teachers or professors are allowed to teach them and we don't have many professors like that um, so we uh, always had um, a co-education in Afghanistan in higher education level and now if they limited to that so girls will lose the chance of studying subjects of their interest. Um, so in this case, it's important that they have access to education online. And we do have the infrastructure in Afghanistan. So there is internet, um, uh, but I think they need scholarships uh, to be given by universities uh, to those girls who are in Afghanistan who want to pursue their education. But I also emphasize that we should also focus on men or young men, because it's important to work on the environment uh, in which a woman uh, is living and working, um, uh, because uh, unfortunately, Taliban are the product of madrasas in Pakistan, which only went through a very limited uh, definition of uh, Islamic Sharia. And therefore they think that only way is for women with limited education or no education uh, seen right for, uh, for them. But uh, while there is a lot of progress in Islamic world, including uh, Saudi Arabia with uh, a lot of changes um, in women mobility, uh, their passports, traveling abroad, education and uh, driving uh, are some of the example. But the rest of the world, I think there is a lot of reforms. Uh, I don't say collectively, there is one nation with so much uh, progress, but as Bloom has done study before that there are, um, there, there are progress in different Islamic countries in particular uh, aspect. And I think um, seeing the diversity in Afghanistan from Shia to Sunni, it's important to see all those changes, which is there in support of women's right in the world that could be uh, used uh, as a tool and as a supportive um, mechanism. Uh, for uh, improving the status of women inside the country. Uh, we certainly need uh, longer dialogue, longer engagement in Afghanistan. And some of this might go through uh, uh, um, inevitably through Taliban. And if that is so, I think women should be ready for uh, more um, informed and stronger discussion based on religion. Um, uh, based on the culture of the uh, region uh, in support of education, in support of their economic participation, in support of their political participation. So I will rest my case here and thank you very much. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for your again. That was very, uh, uh, very insightful and gives us a lot to think about in terms of what we can do. Uh, moving forward. And now I will pass the mic and invite Zarka uh, to, to, to present her thoughts, please. Zarka, please. Thank you so much, uh, Varenda. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good, good evening, uh, everyone. Thank you, Far Olun, for uh, 
providing of the opportunity today to be here and talk and discuss about the situation of women in Afghanistan and what is uh, the reality in the ground and uh, what what is the what is the perspective of Afghanistan women from the uh, international community. Um, uh, this year, uh, the International Women Day was uh, celebrated in all over the world in a time that women of Afghanistan was marginalized from all of their basic rights. And unfortunately, the women of Afghanistan don't have access to any uh, basic rights. The rights which is uh, which is uh, isn't there any obstacle and not uh, uh, um, not uh, on the Islamic laws and also not in the international convention of um, of the of the world. But um, I, I I have remembered that um, last year in the International Women's Day, we had lots of plan. We had lots of dreams about women empowerment and gender equality issue in Afghanistan, and. Uh, when uh, we was in the celebration of International Women's Day last year, we planned that what should we do in, uh, on that year for women of Afghanistan? What should we do for women, peace, women participation in the peace process? What should we do for those women that they are living in the four districts and village of Afghanistan? What should, what should we do to increase uh, uh, girls, uh, uh, to increase uh, um, access of girls to education, especially in the four areas, as uh, there was some problem according to, to the research that we have uh, done in the in the uh, in the last year about the girls education in Afghanistan, and also we had a plan that what should we do to uh, to provide the equal space for women um, and all around the country. But unfortunately, all the things become changed in the country, and uh, all all of uh, people of Afghanistan, especially women of Afghanistan, lost their all of achievement and gains on the 15 August of 2021, and it was very dark day for all people of Afghanistan and especially women of Afghanistan. We lost all of our gain and achievement overnight, and it was because of the being a corrupted government and also because of irresponsibility of international community about their commitment that they have uh, with all uh, all people around the world, especially women of, women of uh, um, Afghanistan. As you know, uh, women of Afghanistan during the past two decades have, uh, have done lots. They, we we uh, we did lots of sacrifice. We uh, through lots of struggles and sacrifice, we had and achieved for some gains and achievement during the past two decades. Uh, before six months, we had a a, a large participation of women in Afghanistan in different areas. We had women as a, a journalist. We had women as a judge. We have a vo we had women as a prosecutor. We had women as an artist. We had women as a MPs. We had women as a minister, as a deputy ministers, as a ambassadors, and also. Uh, there was uh, a thousand organization, government and non-government organization, which was led by women. And uh, the leadership of women was uh, too much better than the leadership of men in Afghanistan. But we lost all of them over a night. And now we have, we, we don't have any things. We, we don't have any achievement. And we, we can talk about nothing in Afghanistan. Um, so, uh, uh, I think it was happening in Afghanistan because uh, uh, because of the irresponsibility of uh, international community. During the 20 years, the women of Afghanistan did a lot, as I mentioned you before, because we had trust to the commitment uh, of the international community. We had trust to the uh, commitment of international community about participation and protection that they have commit committed uh, 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 regarding to their commitment to the regulation 1325. And because of this, we had the National Anc uh, Action Plan for implementation of 1325 resolution in Afghanistan. But I think all of this, uh, all of the trust and uh, uh, that we had an international commitment to their uh, to the, to the different convention and um, resolution and action plans, it was it, it was not something realistic. And um, we 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 saw what's uh, what's uh, will, will will be happen with the world as uh, uh, give uh, living up a nation 
to to their uh, uh, to themselves, and they are not going to have any uh, attention to them. Afghanistan is an, an example that what will be happen that when the international community are not going according to their commitment, are not going according that what they said during the do, during the decades. For, for people, for, especially for women, and uh, what was their uh, strategies for protection and um, participation of uh, women, especially in Afghanistan. So uh, I think uh, when we are seeing the behavior of international community in Afghanistan, uh, I think it will be an example for uh, uh, other uh, countries' women, especially those countries that they are in the same situation of Afghanistan, those countries that right now there is war and conflict and uh, uh, and I hope that the situation of Afghanistan are not repeat on those countries as well because we don't have a, a, a good experience uh, about uh, involvement and support of um, international community. So uh, I want to just, uh, because uh, I want to talk about what is uh, the deep mind and what we want from international community, I, I want to have a short brief about what is going uh, on the ground in Afghanistan about the uh, women's rights issue and uh, what is our deep mind right now from the international community. As you all know, that as I, and as I mentioned, we lost all of our achievement in 15 August of uh, uh, 2021. Right now in Afghanistan, as uh, um, there isn't any the right of uh, education to girls uh, from the grade six. Right now, the universities are open for girls in, in the country, but uh, according to the uh, to the uh, direct contact that I have with different youth groups that we are working with them, the reopening of university is uh, a play. A, it is a, a playing of a game of the Taliban because they just want to have the recognition from the international community from them themselves. There is lots of problem for our our girls that they are going right now to the university. All, all of the girls that they are a student of university, they are not going to the, to the universities as it's open right now, because there is lots of concern, there is lots of fear, there is lots of threat, threat there is lots of risk for them. And uh, in, some, uh, in some provinces, family are not allowing their girls to, to, go to, to, to go to school. I'm sharing an example of one province for you. And, and one of, uh, in the university, of uh, one of the province, all of the female uh, students are about 10. And before the sex, um, and the, uh, it was um, uh, hundreds of students uh, before, um, before coming of the Taliban. Now you can find just 10, uh, um, 10 uh, students and all over the, the university. And this university is not in the district. This is the university which is uh, in the capital of one of the big uh, uh, province of Afghanistan. The situation in Kabul University is as well. There is lots of problem for, uh, uh, for, uh, for female students in the university. Taliban separated even the entrance way for, uh, uh, for boys and girls. They separated their uh, classes. There isn't uh, much uh, female professors in the Kabul University that they teach uh, the female uh, students. As uh, a large number of uh, professors, they left the country, and some of them as, um, are going to, to, to be in other jobs, to, to find some economic resource, to continue their, their lives, to run their lives. And there is a least number of, of, uh, uh, um, of professors that they are going to teach uh, the, the female students in the university. The students don't allow to have mobile when they are going to the university, and um, the uh, and and some of the uh, and and the, some of the classes and faculties, as the number of uh, female students was too least because of this, the uh, the administration of the uh, the leadership administration of the faculty, they uh, said for all of the female students that you should go and don't come to university. We, you can have all of the uh, book and subjects. You can read 
with, with yourself and then you can come for example uh, to pass the exam so i don't know what 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 we we can uh, what is the aim when the students is going to read all of the curriculum in the in their uh, in their home so what is the, what is the meaning of being uh, universities and faculties for improvement the knowledge and capacity of uh, our um, our young generation in the country. And um, uh, inside of this, uh, there is lots of other problem for, um, uh, for uh, female uh, women uh, in the universities um, as well. And uh, this is uh, some kind of, uh, um, when uh, I, a, a female student is coming from a far uh, district of Kabul to Kabul University, there is some restriction uh, in using of local transport as well because uh, there is uh, some specific distance Taliban announced when a woman want um, to go uh, to the uh, in this distance so if they don't have a male a company if there isn't a male a member of their family so they can't uh, they can't use the local transport and the drivers are not uh, picking them so it is it is a, a very big problem for those uh, uh, young students that they don't have any fail, uh, any male uh, company in their house. If we think about uh, those male, male member family that they were killed, they died during the past two decades in the war and conflict, which was in Afghanistan. Those that they were member of police, national police of Afghanistan. Those that they were member of national army of Afghanistan. Those that they killed uh, in the suicide and exclude in suicide attacks and exclusion in the country. So those uh, those students from where they should find and have a, a male account company for them to go to, to the university and uh, continue their, uh, uh, their um, studying in the different university of Afghanistan. And also uh, there isn't any work uh, uh, right uh, for women still in the different uh, uh, ministries, uh, Taliban just uh, uh, allowing the male um, staffs and the and male employee to come to the different uh, ministries and the woman just going twice in a month to fill and to sign their attendance sheet in the different uh, ministries. And still there isn't any signs about reopening of uh, Ministry of Women Affairs. Still there is no any signs about reopening of Afghanistan Independent Human Rights Commission. These two, uh, these two uh, entities was uh, uh, one of the achievement of women of Afghanistan during the past two decades. But there isn't, uh, they, are, they are not working right now and they are not, they, it, uh, it is not uh, open right now. So uh, woman political participation, there isn't any sign for woman political participation uh, still in the country. There isn't, uh, uh, Taliban several times said that uh, being of woman in leadership is, uh, uh, is a big responsibility for women. And sometimes women not, uh, cannot run, the, run uh, and uh, uh, take the responsibility. So it is not, uh, this is not the way that we should put this big responsibility on the uh, shoulder of women. So there isn't any, 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 any things, any news about um, women political participation. And also regarding to uh, selecting of, uh, of clothes and coverage, there is also some restriction. And uh, as, you, as you may be, here, be aware about uh, arresting and disappearing of uh, those women that they raise their voice. They raise their voice for uh, having the right of participation, justice, and freedom in the country. But Taliban arrested and some of them disappeared. And those that dis disappeared and was arrested, they faced lots of violence. Taliban took their video by force and asked them to say that what they want. And those uh, poor uh, women, poor, poor girls, said all of the things that Taliban said for them because of uh, the scares and the concern that they have from their life. And uh, when Taliban released them, Taliban took all of their documents. For example, Taliban took their passports, Taliban took their national ID, and, and ta Taliban took their educational documents and even took their laptops and mobile as well. And now they are, they are in, their, in, in their homes. And uh, now as I be here, there is um, some plan for torturing some of those women as well. So this is the reality of 
of women in the ground. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, two, two weeks ago, 15 civil society activists was killed in one of the province of Afghanistan, in Bakh province, and more than half of them were women were very young girls. But you know, the family, the family of, of the girls, they, they didn't want to share the information with media. And they said, our girls was faced with the COVID-19. And because of COVID, they, they died. They didn't say that Taliban killed them. And uh, this week, two girls, one in Kabul and one in uh, another province of Afghanistan was, was killed. And it was by unknown, uh, unknown people. It was not clear that uh, who is uh, doing this. Right now, the Taliban started the searching of houses in, the, in, a, in, in Kabul and some other province. And they, they are saying that we are going to find ISIS people. We are going to find some thief but unfortunately they are they are they are going to the uh, to all people houses and they want to take everything that they want for example okay. are, again. The vehicles. one minute more yeah thank you and uh, all the things that they want and uh, for now uh, i think uh, the uh, demand that uh, women of afghanistan have from international community we need that international community have uh, 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 to monitor the situation of women in Afghanistan and then share their findings with all uh, uh, all people around the world, with um, those countries, those pol policymakers that they are involved in the situation of Afghanistan. So a uh, Taliban has ex uh, have ex um, concern about their recognition. So the international community can uh, have some precondition for protection of women's rights, for participation of women in the country, and then they can support support and uh, uh, support um, Taliban. And uh, also, uh, uh, I think, till now, the behavior of international community with people of Afghanistan was not fair, fair. So we want that the international community should be a stand and should be support the women of Afghanistan. And uh, I'm sure if the international community is stand with the uh, women of Afghanistan, women of Afghanistan can uh, achieve their right and they can change not just their their life. They can change the life of all people in, in Afghanistan. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you so much for those uh, for those remarks. Uh, I pass now to Professor Tajan. Thank you, Secretary. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yes, I will try to share my screen. Okay. Yes. Um, thank you, everyone, for. Um, for joining us here, and thank you as well to both Pavla Sharjan and Zagrajan for giving us such a comprehensive picture um, of where we are right now and how we got here and where we are right now and what are some of the key um, demands. What I'm going to be talking about is very briefly, I, I definitely wanted to give the floor more to our Afghan um, colleagues, but I wanted to very briefly talk about sort of some of the ways that we want to move forward on behalf of Volume, on behalf of the, the research that we've been doing. And this is just, just some, some of the key sort of suggestive ways in terms of institutionalizing women's rights in rebuilding a democratic Afghanistan. And I want to start out by giving a quote from um, Dilma Rousseff, the former um, pre, um, Brazilian president. She says, equality is the base for strengthening a democracy. A democracy is always stronger, more robust, fuller of life when it champions equality. I am referring to all types of equality, equality of opportunity, equality of rights, gender equality, equality under the law. This word fills a democracy with strength, faith, and hope. Of course, this is from the former um, president of, um, of Brazil. And um, this speech of hers was given two days before she was ousted from power. Currently, Brazil is being run by one of her opponents, um, Jair Bolsonaro, who's, um, as we all know, a, a misogynist, um, quite patriarchal figure. Um, but I'm sharing this in order to say that there is sort of this, this sense of solidarity that we know we want to build a democratic future, a democratic form of governance. But unfortunately, again and again, we're seeing that um, gender equality, equality of different groups is sort of being sidelined. So, so I think just from the get-go, we need to be really critical of, of how do we want to move forward in a context where, um, where it's sort of these inequalities have been part of, uh, part of the fabric of, of how some of these institutionalizations came about. 
So this is where I want to sort of emphasize the um, institutionalization of women's rights. We do know that strong political institutions are a feature of democratic governments. And here I'm referring to formal institutions. And of course, informal institutions also have a pretty big role. But for the purpose of this, I'm really going to talk about formal institutions. And by that, I mean parliaments, national constitutions, government structures, political parties, and so much more. And the reason for that is because this is where we see these entities allow us to have sort of the rules and structures of the government are laid down. There's a rule of law, there's transparency that is ingrained with them. And also there's oftentimes clear political goals and plans that are given by these, uh, by these institutions that if they are not meeting these goals and their plans, it's really key and important for different members of the society to go ahead and sort of point that out and to try to hold them accountable. But unfortunately, frequent interruptions to such institutionalizations do result in unequal tre um, treatment of social groups, authoritarian um, control, limited rule of law, and of course, lack of transparency and so much more. So with the case of Afghanistan, sorry, with the case of Afghanistan, this is what we've been seeing that throughout the past decades, we have witnessed important shifts in terms of women's political participation and re representation in Afghanistan. Um, but in fact, we did have uh, these sort of like what I call them experiments of democratization and institutionalization, they have been interrupted frequently. So moments of expansion, of course, a notable one would be the suffrage in 1964. Then we did have moments of democratization in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And of course, uh, what, um, what Pavasha and Zarfa just talked about, some of the accomplishments of the past two decades, these were really important um, sort of trajectories that the country was, was on the path of, of trying to democratize, trying to establish these, these institutions. Of course, we know they were not perfect. And of course, we know they were far, far from being perfect. They were, you know, there were so many different obstacles, so many different factors that prevented them to sort of deliver what they were aimed to do. But nonetheless, they sort of planted the seeds, you know, the seeds that were um, unfortunately frequently interrupted. And these interruptions often have been due to war, due to conflict, due to foreign occupation. And of course, the most recent interruption has been the August 2021 sudden takeover by the Taliban, which, which we all um, know about. So one thing that's very clear, um, what, what, what my um, co-speakers just talked about is that the Taliban coming to, po um, to power really showed and showcased not to our surprise, but it seemed to the surprise of some others, that they have been maintaining their conservative stance. In fact, the same restrictions that were in place um, during the time when they were in power from 1996 to 2001, we're seeing the exact same restrictions and the women's rights activists and groups, including Wallum, um, there was a lot of effort to try to highlight that, to try to highlight the fact that this particular um, militant fundamentalist group has not moderated their stance, but nonetheless, um, as, um, as, as was already said, it sort of fell on deaf ears. And immediately after we did see institutional reversals as pertaining to women, again, there've been many reversals, but I think the three that I really want to focus on in terms of formal institutions would be the suspension of the Afghan parliament. This is a parliament in which women compose at least 27% of. That is thanks to the parliamentary gender quota that, um, that was adopted in the 2004 national constitution. And this is quite unique for the region. In fact, any country that has been able to accomplish this percentage has often been able to do so only through the, through the passage of gender quota. So that's been a major reversal just to not have this particular institution work. Um, the second has been the, cro uh, the closure of notable national machineries. By na national machineries, I'm really referring to those um, national sort of entities and bodies that were designed to specifically address women's rights, human rights concerns, and that would mean the Ministry of Women's Affairs, as well as the Afghanistan independent human rights council um, so this is these two particular bodies were again set um, afghanistan quite unique in comparison to other countries in the region most other contexts including here in the west we don't even have a women's ministry or if there is a women's ministry it's oftentimes the the, the objectives of it are oftentimes watered down by putting 
women, family, and social affairs as it's done in Turkey and Iran, for instance, or in other contexts. Whereas here, it was really unique in the sense that it was a ministry that was entrusted specifically on this particular issue. And it was doing really notable work, as Sarah just mentioned, in the sense that um, the documentations um, of human rights abuses and the reports that it was giving was, was quite effective um, in that regard. And of course, it was working collaboratively with the international community as well, in terms of the, the CEDA committee that Afghanistan has, has joined and, um, and, is, and, and has been a part of. And then thirdly is the rejection of the 2004 Afghan, um, 2004 Afghan constitution that the Taliban is currently rejecting it. And instead they're pushing for uh, what is called the Emirate constitution. Within this constitution that the Taliban is supporting, there's a rejection of gender equality. There is also a rejection of the need for popular elections. In fact, uh, there's going to be a push towards uh, um, having politics be wrested into the hands of a religious few, of a select few, sort of a religious or clerical oligarchy. And for that reason, then there would be no need to necessarily hold popular elections and therefore no need to have women to be um, included in any major decision making processes. So despite all of these reversals, as um, again, we already heard, women have not remained silent. There are very loud demands coming um, on behalf of women, both from within Afghanistan as well as from abroad, demanding for substantive representation of women in all negotiations and in all decision-making processes. And this is something that's quite uh, that, that's quite vocal at the moment. So at this political juncture, um, I think what we really need to do is to recognize women's agency, uh, particularly those on the ground. And in fact, there are numerous social groups who are being oppressed by the Taliban. Um, but I would go ahead and argue that women's resistance at the moment, it composes among the most viable and pro-democracy and anti-Taliban force that we're seeing today. Um, and that's because there's just so much at stake for women that many feel that, you know, that they have nothing to lose. So they are going to resist and they are going to come um, into the forefront. And that's, and that's really critical. They are also receiving some support from multiple actors to some extent from the international community, at least in terms of, you know, paying lip service to this, but not exactly Again, that in itself is sort of an opening to try to address this. Obviously, um, on behalf of Wulum, we know that there's a lot of transnational solidarity, but that solidarity needs to really be um, collected um, and, and sort of more, more forceful. And talking about a little bit more of a research and academic research perspective, there is a need for a feminist institutionalist analysis. And here I'm referring to the body of literature that falls within the comparative politics of gender that focuses on how institutions are gendered and construct or maintain gender power dynamics. And as part of that, it also asks how can institutions bring about gender equality? How can institutions really force um, to, to sort of have those guidelines to bring about more egalitarian structures and how can we by design sort of work towards that? So Wallum, as we know, is a research-based advocacy and training network. Homa discussed that a little bit in her talk um, it's been around since the 1980s, um, and it's sort of, it, it brings the practice, sort of bridges the divide or the gap, so to say, between the academics as well as the practitioners in order to see how do we provide the knowledge and the training and the know-how on how to address some of the um, sort of grassroots demands and grassroots interests in terms of human rights, in terms of access to education, ac access to healthcare, uh, political decision making, and so on. Um, one example of that would be the late 1980s Women and the Law program that was really effective, as Homa mentioned, that did um, sort of comparative research across 28 Muslim majority countries to find, and, and that research eventually became a catalyst for many reforms and initiatives that were later championed in other contexts, including leading to the creation of Musawa, which is the transnational entity um, that's, um, that's working on reform of family law. But as part of that also, there was a very early on a recognition that women themselves need to be as part of the decision makers. And that was sort of gave birth to the woman and politics project or a program that's been one of the most long lasting um, projects of Wallum. I've had the privilege to have been collaborating with, the, with this project since at least um, 2007. And these are just some of the publications that, that it's been sort of putting forth. So some of the key questions that at the moment we need to research is, 
what have been some of the main obstacles and opportunities that have impacted women's political participation and representation in Afghanistan within the past two decades. And this is where, as I said, sort of those experiments in democratization and institutionalization, they themselves are a good sort of starting point for us to investigate, to see you know, how were how are the promises and the pitfalls of these institutions? What did they, what were they able to deliver? What were in what areas should they be improved and further designed? Um, here we need to definitely look at the key institutions that were addressing women's political empowerment, or that was one of their, their, their goals. Obviously, parliamentary gender quotas in Afghanistan. Um, I, Homa and I have done a lot of work on gender quotas, and I think it's, it's such an important and fascinating topic. And we always say the devil is in the detail when it comes to gender quotas, because it really has to do with how are they specifically designed? How do they work? Um, within the case of Afghanistan, they were quite effective in actually allowing women to enter into the parliament. Obviously, there's, you know, there is room for improvement, particularly within different provinces, within different districts, to make sure who's accessing these, who, who would like to access but is unable to, despite the, the, the quota measure, and so on. Um, obviously, the second issue would be the role of the national women's machineries. Um, as I mentioned, uh, Ministry of Women's Affairs, as well as the Human Rights Commission, they were quite unique in the context of Afghanistan. If there's going to be any sort of move forward on these issues, we really need to be able to address, uh, address these issues, um, as well as gender equality constitutional mandates, which, uh, which are quite um, significant. So the discourses that led to their adoption, as well as the experience and, and their implementation. Um, so some of the way that this research is going to take place is in-depth interviews with women leaders and activists, former politicians, candidates, and politicians. Sorry to interrupt, Mona Jan, but your time yes. is up already. So if okay. you can wrap up in this. I can just, yes, I'll just wrap up with this one last slide. Um, so yes, it's former politicians and candidates and policymakers from local and national levels. Focus on the lessons learned from the promises and pitfalls of these institutions. Role of the international community is really significant. We just heard from our speakers that um, that at one point, you know, some promises were made. Other points, you know, demands were fallen on deaf ears. Um, role of religion and its varying interpretations. Homa will definitely talk about the role of women-centered interpretations. Role of ruling elites and the strategic interactions between competing groups. Um, so basically, a key question is how to institutionalize women's rights moving forward with. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It was fascinating. It's a fascinating overview of what, what's happened and what more can be done. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna to pass to Homa for some short remarks, Homa Jan, very short remarks, three minutes, and I'll interrupt you at two. Well, I just wanted to, in 2020, we, we consulted with Afghan uh, women leaders uh, and um, talked about how, what are the kind of things that we, uh, women can, room can do in this set. Well, they're set, they came out, um, uh, it became clear that one of the problem is a lot of the policies that were done, it was actually done and uh, justified um, logically and debated, but it was never put, uh, look through religious lens. No one developed the argument for, for this religious lens. And of course, not, uh, um, this was 2020 when Taliban were not still in power. They wanted to learn about the argument from the religious lens. And so that's one of the things they asked us to develop with a specific area which I will list. But also they wanted to mobilize, mobilize the women's movement in the Muslim context in support of their areas uh, their, their, their rights and develop with something like we did in a comparative analysis of women's rights in different Muslim countries, which we are in the process of doing. But the, in the specific areas, they, um, they, I briefly say there were more things to say, but there's no time. They wanted to look at women's imposition of authority from the Islamic lens, um, to look through the constitution, the constitution 2004, again, through the Islamic, uh, uh, lens, which I've done, but they're more specifically with women's uh, women's question in it, and they also, especially the, and as it was mentioned, the question of women's mobility and question of women having to go with Mahram, the male family male member, uh, has become a major obstacle. So that we are looking in through through that and education. Um, um, education at all higher level and access to sciences was one of the other areas that. You know, Taliban 
want to have a specific um, curriculum for women and a specific for men. And this is, of course, not after, this is not actually practiced in any of the Muslim countries. And, um, and again, justification about um, shelter, women's shelter. They say Islamic society don't need uh, shelter because we don't have violence against women. Well, that's one of the questions that when we are looking into um, shelter um, for women uh, from the Islamic point of view, uh, and the Quranic, um, in um, some 35 years ago, we had developed a Quranic kit which made all the issues that are related to women and most, more importantly, too uh, accessible to women so they don't have to go and look everywhere. We are re re revising that summer. with new, new ideas. Uh, and also about uh, employment and, um, and Ministry of Women. Well, these are issues that we are now developing arguments from Islamic lens from by a team that we put together by women, mostly women from Indonesia, but also other countries, but majority are from Indonesia and are from the uh, Islamic scholar group. So I will stop here and pass Thank on. you very much. Thank you very much uh, to all our speakers. Um, and now in the remaining time, I'd like to open the floor for comments or questions, if you could please just type it into the chat. While people are thinking of a question, I had a question that I wanted to pose to you, Palwaj, actually, um, and to Zarka. And this is a question that comes up all the time um, with regard to Afghanistan currently. And that is the question of engaging with the Taliban or rejecting the Taliban and how can we have a pragmatic engagement moving forward? Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I think we um, have very divided uh, uh, position on this issue of engaging or um, rejecting Taliban. Um, um, but in both case, um, uh, it is not accepting Taliban as it is, or it's not about recognition uh, uh, or uh, legitimizing their position. Um, uh, uh, based on that, uh, I would say uh, that engagement is um, with Taliban is important. Uh, uh, unfortunately, they are now the harsh reality of Afghanistan society. Uh, I don't think our society can afford another uh, conflict. Uh, we are in conflict for last over 43 years now. Uh, I think world is uh, tired of engaging or, um, and probably that is the reason that they left without even uh, reconsidering their decision. So it's very difficult to bring back um, the kind of support that we had, let's say in 2001 with NATO and other countries. So the only way is um, uh, engaging with Taliban, uh, but uh, uh, to confirm that, that engagement doesn't mean uh, um, recognition or uh, legitimizing uh, them. Uh, but it means a dialogue where uh, men and women uh, who are having different perspective in Afghanistan for uh, forming an inclusive government, for uh, forming an inclusive society, it's important to engage in a dialogue which, which could be facilitated by international community. Uh, despite of that, I would say still there is a, a group of um, uh, thinkers in Afghan society who thinks that even engaging with Taliban will mean recognizing them. And based on that stance, they are rejecting this position. Um, uh, and probably they have their own argument uh, about that. Uh, I personally think um, uh, we don't, uh, we cannot afford uh, another conflict. Um, uh, so many people uh, are uh, killed in this war from last 43 years. Part of the reason that uh, Afghan didn't fight the fight because there is very low motivation for our arm uh, fighting. So I think Taliban had a swift military victory and um, uh, there is no reason uh, for them to be proud of um, using that uh, by ignoring and sidelining other ethnicities in Afghanistan or um, isolating women based on their gender. Uh, 
uh, because they're thinking they are winning. Because winning a war is very different than governing a country. People need services that they cannot deliver. People need, um, like, even the treatment uh, of um, when they detained uh, women activists, they they were on total denial, and it's not good for a government to act like a vendetta or uh, um, continue to act like a uh, military group and saying, "Oh, we don't have, we don't know about their whereabouts." So they still don't know what is expected of a government, or uh, uh, what is expected of even if they are de facto authority, they should know that they have responsibility because if you're in control. Uh, you are also uh, uh, responsible for a citizen uh, service for their protection, uh, and you cannot just go about like uh, uh, um, oppressing people to be silent. People will speak, uh, and it will continue. Um, and I think nonviolent, um, uh, nonviolent. Um, uh, uh, efforts will continue by Afghan civil society, by activists all over the country because uh, uh, it is uh, impossible um, uh, to live under the rule which Taliban are prevailing in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghan is a very um, a mosaic, um, multi-ethnic society and we need participation of everyone to make sure that uh, the country is running. Besides, we all have different uh, idea for running that government, which is possible through a democratic election. And I think for that, we have to uh, uh, fight. And that fighting not necessarily means military fighting. It could mean like demonstration, uh, uh, which is unfortunately met with brutality by Taliban till this moment. Um, so we are asking for conditionality of international support, conditionality on uh, recognition, conditionality on sanction left um, to be based on how much Taliban gave away in freedom to civil society, in freedom to human rights, um, and freedom to participation and inclusion of uh, different Afghan communities um, uh, in the decision making. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. It is a tricky, uh, tricky line to negotiate. And uh, before we go to the next question, I just wanted Zarka's response to the question, please. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Varanda. About uh, rejecting our engagement with the Taliban, I think um, uh, right now, uh, as um, there isn't any signs, um, a sign about uh, uh, human rights value and uh, women's right um, uh, protection of women's rights from the Taliban side. So it is um, very difficult that, that we said that we are going to engage with them and we are going to reject, reject the Taliban. Uh, because of this, as I mentioned before, uh, the international community should have very uh, very strong condition uh, condition about um, participation of women in the country and also uh, protection of uh, uh, women's right value human's right value freedom of speech value uh, to the Taliban and then the, and then we can say that um, they are uh, they are uh, they are uh, honest on uh, to what they are saying to the world and uh, or they are not um, um, honest to what they are um, saying in the world so uh, for uh, for now, uh, I think uh, uh, there isn't any difference between Taliban and ISIS because some of the people saying that um, if we not engage with the Taliban and uh, some countries saying if the world recognize Taliban, so the alternative will be the ISIS. So from my perspective, there isn't any difference between ISIS and Taliban in Afghanistan. They are the same people. Taliban, uh, Taliban uh, I, I think Taliban and ISIS uh, are the same. They don't believe to, to the life of people. They are all terrorist group. They are, they are not uh, respecting women's rights in the country. So I think there isn't any concern about uh, uh, alternative of Taliban with ISIS. But uh, I think uh, it is very important that the international community have condition. Um, for example, they put some condition about all of the, uh, the value that I, I mentioned before to the Taliban. And then they say that if they are honest and they went through according to their commitment, if they, if, if they are 
accepting to establish an inclusive government with participation of women and all ethnic in Afghanistan. Right now, there is a, a, a one ethnic and also without any gender participation in the country. So Afghanistan is, um, uh, is included of uh, different national and also women is uh, women is uh, more than of uh, more than of, of the population of Afghanistan. Women are more than 15 million of people of Afghanistan. They are not um, included in the government. So when the Taliban is agreed to establish an inclusive government, when they agree to establish a government uh, through the inclusive election, so on that time we can think about engagement with the Taliban and then think about how we can go with the Taliban. Thank you very much. So uh, I'll just pass a question to Homa and then we have Nandini has a question. Homa, go ahead and ask your question. Um, yeah, I actually just wanted to uh, make a comment about Taliban always uh, continuously claim they have broad security. But I, I always I feel like yeah, security because they were the one who were creating insecurity. They were the one who were attacking and and now they say we have created security. Well, yeah, what would say now that they are in power, they want to attack again? <laughs> it's like giving themselves credit for for not committing crimes. So that was that was one of the um, issues that every time they say I, I feel like answering them in this way. Secondly, I wanted to say part of the problem with also the peace talk as both uh, Zare and Parash have brought up is that in the negotiation, they didn't include enough women, not only that they didn't include, but the UN committee, the international committee that went, they didn't include uh, like 50% women to talk to them. They didn't demand the Taliban to bring women, even if the women come and just sit there. So we didn't force them, we didn't, um, we didn't, as an international community, we didn't make this that participation of women is a condition of them coming back to, to, um, to um, government. So maybe now we have to think ways of doing that and starting with the UN, UN and other international community to, when they have a, um, they have a group to negotiate with them, always include that 50% women. And I mean, we have had this experience with Libya and it made major difference having women in the team of nego negotiating. So I stop here because I know there are other questions. Right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for those comments and the example of Libya. And I'll pass the, the mic to Mona, please. Thanks. I just had a quick question from Palvasha. Um, you mentioned that there might be a possibility or there's some work. So has there been any work on uh, enabling more online education for girls and women, particularly from, from those of us in the West? Uh, there are a few efforts going on uh, by some Afghan who are now in the US and in other countries to start with online education for children or uh, uh, for women, uh, but it's very limited uh, at this point. Uh, I didn't heard of scholarships like uh, proper university graduate or postgraduate uh, students. Uh, I, I didn't heard, and I think this is one area that uh, would be necessary um uh, to avail for uh, those young women um although i would say maybe beside women we also need men who are pro women's right who have the chance of uh, better education and not be thinking on the same line as taliban uh, also have education but in a very restricted <laughs> um manner uh, where there is no woman in their uh, world. Um, so it's important for a balanced society that we have education for men and women and that possibility should come. And partly because we lost um, uh, due to sort of uh, what happened because of the terror which was created, many of us left and there is a big vacuum left behind. We need to fill that and we need more younger generation to take over uh, for that. We need skilled, uh, continue with uh, skilled, educated and people with progressive and um, uh, uh, better vision for Afghanistan to be there to make difference for over 30 million uh, population, which is still inside the country. 
Thank, thank you very much for Russia. Uh, Shahin, if I'm going, to, uh, please go ahead and ask your question. If you could just introduce yourself in one line, please. Yeah, yes. Um, my name is Shahin Akhtar Munir. I am a member of South Asian Women's Community Center in Montreal. And also, I, I am a research associate of Simon de Beauvoir Institute in Concordia University. So, uh, I am, it's, it, the, the discussion was very much moving. And I very quickly, I, I want to uh, share my some thoughts about uh, two issues uh, about that the Pulse Pal Wasa, she talked about the access to education online and providing a scholarship. Here we are from two universities, leading universities of the world, the Magdal University and the Concordia University. And uh, my proposal that what we can do for these unfortunate girls of Afghanistan to providing online situation, uh, online education. And the second question is, my thought is about the Jarka's demands on the recognition for the Taliban government. And she asked that, that uh, for the protection, if the, if, the, if the Taliban government provide protection of the women's rights and also provide the atmosphere for the participation of the women in all walks of life. So my, my thought is that from this open year, what action we can take, like whether we can take a international community campaign, like appealing to the international communities and by petition or any other means. Thank you, Birinda, for giving me the time. Not at all. Go ahead, please. Uh, so we'll go ask, turn to Parvasha and then mm -hmm. Sarka, please. Uh, yeah, I think uh, it will be good for uh, if we have this sort of uh, scholarship event. Of course, um, uh, as I said, we have the infrastructure in Afghanistan. We have internet. Uh, we still connect back with home uh, through WhatsApp and uh, Zoom and other links. So there is that possibility for young people to uh, to take benefit of any possibility available to them. Of course, the process of selection and others. Uh, all of us has experience um, uh, in in that process we can also um, sort of uh, match you with uh, relevant in, uh, private university in Afghanistan um, there is Afghan Women Network there is Afghan Women Educational Center who can uh, facilitate the process uh, for the selection uh, maybe preparation even of these students um, because maybe initial um, uh, so what we would need not only access to the scholarship uh, but also um, maybe be basic support in terms of internet because it is expensive back at home to get a package which is uh, reliable in terms of uh, strength of the capacity in others and maybe a little bit more support than that so that the students uh, are supported maybe um, uh, with that and then um, uh, I think this will be not something difficult to manage or organize um, if there is any such intention I will be happy to uh, avail myself to support the process of linking or facilitating. Thank you. Thank you, Parvashidan. Um, Sarka? Uh, thank you, Valinda. Uh, I, I want to just add that um, for uh, identifying of those students, it is, uh, it is uh, important that uh, there is a possibility of a scholarship for them outside of the country, but um, I think it is very important for some of the uh, young, uh, young uh, girls that they are in the province of Afghanistan and also they are living in the district and village. So if we find the opportunity for them to be uh, unselected uh, in the different scholarship in the, in the capital of Afghanistan, I think it is very difficult that we find opportunity of a scholarship um, outside of the country for um, a large number of <coughs> female students in Afghanistan. So we can also provide this this kind of a scholarship in the uh, in some private university and in, uh, in, uh, in Kabul as well. And uh, the ways that how we can find because uh, uh, we there is different network. There is a, we have the different connection with the young youth groups, uh, especially students. So it is very easy and about the um 
how how you can to support us uh, uh, to uh, to have to share uh, and also to share the voice of uh, uh, Afghanistan women uh, with the world. I think it is very important that um, uh, our sister organization and also our uh, uh, other um, uh, other organization around the world, uh, if they stand with um, women of Afghanistan, if they support the stand of women, and if they show their solidarity with the women of Afghanistan through social media, through media, through different conference, international conference, and then uh, in every year that they can raise the voice of Afghanistan women with world leaders, this is some, some way to support us. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I see now that we are at the, at the end of our time, and so uh, I wanted to give a big hand, a virtual hand, to our four speakers. Thank you very much. It was very interesting to hear from you and to learn from your insights. So I thank you for your participation on behalf of the Human Rights Center, Bulum and the Simon de Beauvoir Institute. Thank you also to our participants. Thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come to hear our speakers and to make sure that the voice of Afghan women remains in the spotlight and not forgotten. So thank you very much. Please stay tuned to our uh, Human Rights Center newsletter to see any other events which will also be forthcoming. So thank you very much and uh, it was good of you to come.